In today's video, we're talking about micrometastatic prostate cancer, which is prostate cancer that doctors suspect may be present, but it's not showing up on a scan. Now, we used to have older bone scans where they really were not as sensitive as what we have today, which is PSMA PET scans. So Dr. Scholz is going to talk about what the monitoring process and possibly the treatment process of micrometastatic disease is now that we have PSMA PET scans. So today, Dr. Scholz, we're talking about micrometastatic prostate cancer. And so, you know, when we hear micro, we think small, but metastases still carry so much weight and it's still a kind of a scary concept to a lot of people. So maybe we can define the situation in which like the Gleason score and the types and the situation in which somebody would encounter a micrometastatic disease. Yeah, we probably should define it first. So micrometastatic means a small amount of uh, cancer cells have jump to another part of the body, perhaps the lymph nodes or the bones. By definition, these are not visible by any scans, and that's what micrometastatic means. How do we even know that one individual has or doesn't have micrometastatic disease? And the answer is that through experience and many years of doctors giving surgery or radiation to men that didn't have visible metastasis after scanning, later developed a spot in a lymph node or a bone, you can extrapolate backwards and say that man must have had micrometastatic disease at the time of his surgery or his radiation because the primary tumor was removed. There was no cancer that could cause future metastasis. So the cancer metastasis must have already been present at the time of the surgery or the radiation. And thus the term micrometastasis. And, uh, these micrometastases can show up, uh, you know, because over time they grow and then they do become visible at some juncture down the line, you know, one to 15 years after surgery or radiation. The, one of the issues, of course, with prostate cancer is we monitor PSA and PSA gives you an early signal that there's some cancer out there. If someone's been through surgery or radiation and their PSA is rising, uh, then uh, clearly there's an indication of cancer but historically we haven't been able to localize where it was coming from. Tumors will eventually grow large enough to become visible on scans and then we work backwards from that assumption. Oh, so there's a spot in the lymph nodes or bones. This individual had to have had micrometastatic disease back when he was diagnosed and when he underwent surgery or radiation. So this sort of a explanation is important because there are factors what you could look at it when a man is initially diagnosed, such as the Gleason score, how high the PSA is, how large the tumor is, that will predict, and not accurately, predict inaccurately the possibility that this individual, say someone with Gleason 8 or 9, is more likely to have micrometastasis than a person with a Gleason score of 7. Unfortunately, it's a very imperfect art. And as a result, historically, our method for treating people with higher Gleason scores is to err on the side of caution and to give them extra hormone treatment, extra radiation to lymph nodes as a precaution against the possibility of micrometastatic disease existing, even though we can't see it. Before I get to my next question, please click that subscribe button. When you do this, it tells YouTube that this video is helpful for you, and they'll push our videos out to other people who are searching for answers when it comes to prostate cancer. Also, if you would like to join our cause, you can do so at pcri.org forward slash donate. Now back to my conversation with Dr. Scholz. So it sounds like with these older technologies and older scans, you know, bone scans and all that, that micrometastases was a bigger issue. But now with PSMA, you know, here in 2024, those are more common than normal. So how is that affecting micrometastatic disease and the treatment of micrometastatic disease now? It's hard to evaluate because the scans are such a dramatic breakthrough. I've characterized them as being the biggest technological breakthrough in the prostate cancer realm since the discovery of PSA 30 plus years ago. The elephant in the living room, the $64,000 question or whatever cliche you want to use for what really matters in the oncology world. Since many forms of prostate cancer don't spread, what a shame to give these individuals unnecessary treatments such as hormone treatments that can cause all kinds of side effects when they didn't even need it in the first place. On the other hand, if someone does have micrometastatic disease, could we be losing an opportunity 
to cure something and so that they don't have to be on hormone therapy the rest of their life to keep them alive. Now with having PSMA PET scans, do we still have to pay as much attention to the Gleason score? Shouldn't we just look and see if there is metastatic disease? How good are these PSMA PET scans? Modern PSMA PET scans can find metastatic disease or at least tell us that it isn't present with about 90% accuracy in Gleason 7 patients and with about 80% accuracy in Gleason 8, 9, and 10 patients. So if someone is a Gleason 9 and say a PSA that's around 10 or so, the PET scan shows no metastasis, you can be confident that 80% of the time that individual will not have micrometastatic disease and can then consider foreshortening or even foregoing uh, the adjuvant hormone therapy, which is typically given for 18 months in men with these higher Gleason scores. It's a evol rapidly evolving situation. The problem is we don't have long-term trials uh, looking at how often foregoing hormone therapy in a PSMA PET negative patient will translate into some difficulty with them down the line. The other way that PSMA PET is affecting this whole decision-making process is that in men historically who relapsed after surgery or radiation with the old-fashioned scans, we wouldn't find out where the metastatic site was until the PSA was 30 or 40. And that was unacceptable. So everyone had to go on hormone treatment when they relapsed and, uh, and keep the disease in check that way. Now, with PSMA PET scans, which can detect cancer when the PSA is 0 0.2, 0 0.5, uh, we are finding where the cancer is and then we can pursue it eradicate it with radiation. And the specter of a relapse now in this modern era is nowhere near as serious and frightening as it used to be. It's um, a rapidly changing field. Many of the experts are in disagreement as to whether we should continue with our old policy of giving 18 months of hormone therapy to all patients with Gleason 8 or higher. Uh, whereas others are starting to adapt to the fact that we have this powerful new technology to help us. So when it comes to newly diagnosed men, you know, should every man who is newly diagnosed with prostate cancer be getting a PSMA PET scan? When I see patients coming in who uh, have had a CAT scan and a bone scan, as we, I always ordered a CAT scan and a bone scan in everyone with a Gleason 7 or higher, and to make sure there were no met metastatic lesions, uh, if people had PSAs under 15 to 20, it was almost never any chance of finding any metastatic disease, but it was just sort of you had to check. I have not ordered a CAT scan and a bone scan for years now uh, since the PET scans, the new PSMA PET scans have come out. So any place where a doctor is suggesting that you need a scan and he wants to order a CAT scan or a bone scan suggests getting a PSMA PET scan. They're 10 times better. The threshold for doing a PET scan is probably at Gleason 7 or higher. We know that Gleason 6s don't metastasize, so why would we be doing a PET scan? There are some favorable 7s, some 3 plus 4s with relatively small percentage of grade 4 on the biopsy that are practically never going to have metastatic disease. Why would we order any kind of a scan? Um, as the PSA gets higher, then the staging role of PSMA PET scans becomes, I think, just routine. The other consideration is that in patients who had a biopsy or a spot of cancer, and maybe it's a Gleason 6, but maybe there's another spot that's been seen in the MRI that wasn't biopsied, PET scans can be done to see if that spot lights up or not, rather than sticking needles in. So for the newly diagnosed, there is occasionally, I think, a role for a PSMA PET scan to sidestep doing a biopsy. The reason I mention it is after biopsies, most insurance companies will not cover PSMA PET scans unless there's been a previous biopsy. So either you're going to be writing a check for five or $10,000, or um, you're not going to get it covered if you have a spot on an MRI that has never been biopsied and you don't have a pre-existing diagnosis of prostate cancer. This comes up though in our patients that have a pre-existing diagnosis. They have Gleason 3 plus 3, they've been under surveillance, on active surveillance for some time. Now they've got an MRI, which we usually do annually, that shows a new spot in another location. And our options are to biopsy that, which is what we historically would do, is perform a targeted biopsy, or get a PSMA PET scan, which 
actually is covered because Gleason 3 plus 3 is considered cancer. And it's a nice way for that individual to be able to avoid having needles stuck in them. So what about in situations where somebody has already had surgery or radiation and now we're watching the PSA, they're monitoring it, but does PSMA scans come into play to avoid, you know, maybe going on hormone therapy or something like that? Yes. So, so that's an equally revolutionary situation. Uh, for years we've had tremendously accurate radiation treatment where they can put radiation within millimeters of where they want it to be in very high doses and sterilize cancer. But we often, if not always, were at odds as where is the cancer when PSA was rising after surgery or radiation. So we weren't able to harness that wonderful radiation technology to zap spots of cancer because we couldn't find the spots. Now, all of a sudden the scan appears with this amazing accuracy, allowing us now for the first time to know where the cancer is. And to me, it seems to take some of the teeth out of the danger of these metastatic lesions. With the old scans where you would only find big chunks of cancer, we, we would radiate them, but we figured that there would be other smaller spots uh, and there were, and the enthusiasm for radiating spots was sort of lukewarm. And we would always add hormones and, and sometimes chemotherapy to go after the known invisible micrometastatic disease that had to be in the background. In my experience now, having had the PSMA PET scans now for several years, uh, completely changed. Often, these men who have very low PSAs in whom we find metastatic lesions, maybe they'll have one or two lymph nodes somewhere, we are hopeful, and in many times it proves to be the case, that that's the only metastatic disease. So if we can simply radiate those spots, sterilize them, they will be cured, which is a paradigm shift of unimaginable proportions. The, this is curing metastatic disease is thought to, to uh, almost occur never. Instead of loading up these people with hormones and chemotherapy, to go after the additional micrometastatic disease, we're pushing patients more toward just doing the radiation, seeing if the PSA goes down to zero, which it often does, and then just watching them. And if another spot shows up a few years later, get another PET scan, find it, eliminate it, and possibly cure it. Can you further define what watching them means, like how you, the timeline of all that? Yeah, so men that are, have been through therapy, either it's surgery or radiation to their prostate, or maybe they've gone th had a metastatic site radiated, we typically put them on a schedule of checking their PSA every three months. Over time, that could get boring and repetitive, say after a year or two, and then we'll start st stretching out the intervals to every four to six months, and even annually. So, you know, I've had patients that have been what, cured uh, with metastatic disease. It's now been 10 years. They have a normal testosterone. Their PSA is undetectable. So we just check their PSA once a year. And what's your definition of cured? A continually low, stable PSA for a very extended period of time. With high-grade disease, if you've gone three or four years without a relapse, you quite possibly are cured. With lower, more indolent disease, you may go six, seven years, eight years, and you start to be really confident that you're cured. People need to realize that, so you have complete remission, that means we're waiting for enough time to go by for someone to be cured and then we have the actual cure, which means enough time has gone by that we are 100% sure that it'll never come back. So the, it's both the stable, uh, low PSA with an undetectable PSA that is uh, durable over time. Until that a, a certain interval of time has gone by, they're in what we call a complete remission, which means they're possibly cured. So, the, you know, we're going to have situations where patients don't really want to take that risk. They want the, maybe they want that systemic therapy. They're very concerned about these micrometastatic concepts of whether this is running around. And they say, I want to go on hormone therapy, Dr. Scholz. I want the pelvic, uh, you know, lymph node radiation, and I would like to treat this. So what options do they have should they choose that path? In high-risk patients who we estimate have that 20% chance that there's micrometastatic disease, and we estimate, based on experience over many years, that if you give pelvic lymph node radiation and some hormone therapy at the same time, that you'll eradicate the disease about half the time. So that means that someone with high-risk disease could go from an 80% cure rate to a 90% cure rate. So for some people, the price of admission being inconvenience and side effects is worth worth the cost, and they would like to proceed with that. I suppose the question then comes is, do we need to do the full 18 months, which has been the historical thing. After all, this person has a clear PET scan, and, and we're, 
We, only, we know that only one out of five patients will actually have disease. Let me say before I answer that question, the pelvic lymph node radiation in skillful hands has got to be very tolerable. So, and when I think of foregoing uh, adjuvant treatment like this in high-risk patients to spare side effects, I'm really thinking about sparing the side effects of the hormone treatment. The pelvic lymph node radiation tends to be a lot easier compared to the radiation to the prostate itself. The prostate's very sensitive, the bladder's close, the rectum's close. That's a high-risk, high-reward proposition. Pelvic lymph node radiation, is, with modern technology, men seem to sort of breeze through that. It's really, it's really a, quite remarkable. Then the decision really comes down to hormone therapy, how long and what kind, because there are um, first and second generation hormone treatments. And I think in the selection of treatment for hormone therapy, the type a natural thing to consider is to start on medicines that have reversible side effects. The problem with medicines like Lupron and, and Eligar, Trelstar, Firmagon, is that they tend to have lingering low testosterone levels even after they wear off. And in particular for someone that's maybe on the fence about this and has decided, well, I'll start on some hormone treatment, see how well I tolerate it. and use that as partly a way to decide how long to stay on the hormone treatment. I think that's a very logical thing. If they get started and continue it for some period of time, there's going to be some benefit. And many people believe that the major benefit occurs early on, not between 12 and 18 months, but probably in the first six months. So to start on medicines, uh, hormone medicines that have reversible side effects, see how people do, they should take all the usual precautions, exercise and whatnot. Uh, and if they tolerate it well, continue it for uh, as long as they feel that they can. I would say that the, the minimum time to commit to would be four to six months. And that will probably get 60, 70, 80% of the hormone value that you're going to get. And then going, you know, an extra six months or, or so up to 12 months, maybe. It would be, I think, a real diehard patient that wants to do 18 months of treatment that has a negative PSMA PET scan. So I think that's the nice thing about the uh, use of hormone therapy. If you use medicines such as uh, Regalolex, uh, uh, Orgovix is the other name for it, uh, medicines, uh, second generation medicines such as uh, Nubeca, Extandi, Berlita, or Zytiga, effects will wear off pretty quickly. If you get into the hormone treatment, you go, whoa, Nelly, this is way more than I bargained for. I'm getting out of here, um, which you can do. Patients should realize that they have an option to jump ship anytime they want. So that means, though, that they need to select a medicine that's going to allow their testosterone to recover in a fairly timely fashion compared to some of the older injectables. We have a lot of patients that write into the comment section and they are facing, you know, when we talk about what we're talking about in these videos, this is from a medical oncologist who's very practiced in prostate only for 30 years. And some of these patients are facing urologists or oncologists where, you know, they're not as up to date and maybe they're not, you know, they're putting them on hormone therapy and they say, you have to do 18 months of hormone therapy period because of you have this type of, you know, prostate cancer. What encouragement would you give to those patients and how to have those conversations and advocating for themselves? If they try and steer the treatment towards these reversible medicines uh, and uh, they're open to the idea of pursuing this, then, uh, of course, they're the ones that are enduring the side effects. So if the side effects seem to be modest and tolerable, they can go for a longer period of time. And if they turn out to be in that group of men that find it, you know, fingernail on the blackboard type experience, then they may say, the percentage improvement in my cure rates may only be 3 or 4 5%. This just isn't worth it, uh, especially if you have somewhat more elderly men. I mean, let's say you're dealing with someone in their 70s. Well. Average survival is about 10 years, so I want to spend a significant percentage of the rest of my life without testosterone to have a 3 or 4% improvement in cure rates. It just seems like an unfair trade-off. So before the advent of PSMA scans, we have, you know, these bone scans, and the definition of micrometastatic disease was anything that couldn't be picked up on those bone scans. But now we're in an era where PSMA exists, and really, is micrometastatic disease, does it still have that same definition? Because it kind of sounds like it doesn't. I don't think it does any longer. The word micrometastatic in a, a professional's heart and mind prior to the advent of PSMA PET scans would strike fear, because we would really allocate that person into the category of being incurable. It may take time, we can postpone it with hormone treatment, but, but we're not gonna get rid of it. It's gonna come back in different places. And that still can happen, but it seems that it's gonna be the minority of people. 
Whereas many patients, uh, especially if we're really diligent in getting these scans done early, PSAs are 0 0.2, 0 0.5, that uh, maybe the majority of these people are going to be cured. And so the whole, the whole fear that, that uh, revolves around this concept of metastatic, I don't care if you put the word micro in front of it, is starting to be dissipated with, as a result of this fantastic new technology. What really stood out to me in my conversation with Dr. Scholz is just how much medical technology has changed. These older bone scans were not as sensitive as now what we have PSMA PET scans. And we're able to even have that conversation with your doctor where you can say, hey, is there the possibility of postponing or foregoing hormone therapy? I would really encourage you, you know, if you're in a situation where there is concern that there is a possibility that micrometastatic disease may be present, to advocate for yourself, talk to your doctor, and he may, you know, have a shorter appointment with you and say, just go on the hormone therapy. But I would encourage you, even if it's difficult, to talk to your doctor about the information that you've learned and see if this is a possibility for you. Our job at PCRI is to give you information and not advice. And so as you are empowering yourself and as you're educating yourself on this whole process, your voice in those appointments really matters because this is affecting you and your personal health and your quality of life. If you need help building up your questions or finding out more information on a more case-specific level, you can contact our helpline at pcri.org forward slash helpline. And they're, you know, prostate cancer patients who have been trained by our medical oncology team, and they are able to help you kind of build your research up over time. Also, if you would like to join our cause, you can do so at pcri.org forward slash donate. But please remember, most of all, you're not alone. The best thing you can do is to take care of yourself, put your quality of life at the forefront of dealing with this cancer situation, and, you know, live your life to the best that you can. We really appreciate you. Thank you for trusting us, and I hope you have a great week.